Hi, I'm JJ Barons from Armport Systems. Uh, thanks to Google for letting us use our building. Um, we're going to have a special Bay Piggies talk today by uh, Jacob Kaplan Moss, one of the lead developers of Django. Django is a very, very cool um, web application framework which I've used and I like a lot. And you know, we were getting banged around by Ruby on Rails for a long time, and so it's it's really nice to have such great, cool stuff in in the Python world. And now. Let's listen to someone more important than me, Jacob. All right. Well, thanks. Um, so I've spent the last few days at the MySQL convention here. And all the PHP and MySQL talk is, has made my brain hurt. So what I'm going to ask from you is if I'm boring you, being too, too, uh, spending too much time on the, on the details, you know, tell me to, uh, to skip a bit. Um, and similarly, if I'm moving too fast and you have questions, just stop me at any point. Um, I, I don't have this down to a science, so interrupt me, etc. So my name is Jacob Kaplan Moss. Um, I'm one of the lead developers of Django, which is an open source web development framework for Python. I'm imagining that most people here know what Django is. Is there anyone who doesn't? Sweet. So I grew up here in the Bay Area, uh, Redwood City, actually. And so as you might imagine, um, when I grew up, I uh, moved to Kansas, um, which actually isn't as bad as you might think. <laughs> uh, actually, it's really cool. Um, Lawrence, Kansas, where I live, uh, is an amazing town, a uh, college town, uh, this really awesome downtown. It's got one of the best used bookstores I've ever been in in my life. It's got an amazing uh, live music scene. Um, we, We've been called the Midwest's Austin, which is pretty awesome considering it's a town of 80,000. Um, seriously, the music scene is amazing. You walk downtown on a Friday night and you'll hear you know, eight different bands playing. Um, we have bands that come through Lawrence that are playing, selling out stadiums on the coasts, playing in little jazz clubs in, uh, in downtown Lawrence. There's an amazing local brewery um, and a number of other incredibly cool things. But I didn't know that when I moved there. I moved there to work for the local newspaper. Um, but actually, more precisely, I moved there to work with these guys, uh, Adrian Halavati on the left and Simon Willison uh, on the right. Um, I had known who these guys were for a long time. And when a job opened to work with them, I scratched my head a bit and went, what are they doing working in Kansas? But I couldn't pass up the possibility of, of working with these, these amazing guys. And when I got there, I found out what they were doing in Kansas. They had this thing. At the time, it was called the CMS. Um, and it's what eventually became Django. But I'm going to step back a bit and go through the history of Django. So this is uh, a picture of election night, uh, 1957. And if you look in the background, you can see a blackboard. That's actually the first version of Django back then. No. Um, <laughs> oh, seriously, in a very real way, you can claim that Django started in the 1850s when the newspaper was founded. Uh, it's a family-owned newspaper, and they've always set an extremely high premium on innovation. Um, the owner of the newspaper, the current owner, is the fourth generation in the family. He is in his 70s. He doesn't know how to use com a computer. He, his secretary will print out emails and bring them to him. He will write on them in pencil, and she'll type back in the, the content. Now, this is the owner of the company, and he has built one of the most amazing web teams I've ever had the ability to, to work with. Um, so our flagship project is this thing called Lawrence.com. And it's got all the cool buzzwords, MP3s, RSS everywhere, podcasts. Eh. We even have a print edition which is taken from the website um, rather than the other way around. Uh, for a long time, we were the only company doing this. Now there's a few people who have copied us. Um, the, our bloggers become columnists. Readers submitted photos become our photo pages. Stories are suggested by readers. Most of, most of the content is posted online first. C usually comments on stories are published in line with the rest of the story. Now, originally, this was all written in PHP. And this was before I was there. But 
they, Adrian and Simon went through a very similar process that I went through. We discovered that PHP had some issues. Um, <laughs> everyone knows that maintenance is sort of the biggest part of developing software. It's really fun writing things up front. It's much less fun maintaining things. And we all discovered that maintaining PHP is incredibly hairy. For example, this is a list of every A function in PHP available in every scope. PHP doesn't have namespaces. I'm told the reason it doesn't have namespaces is when they discussed the feature for inclusion in PHP 5, they couldn't agree on a syntax. I imagine that some of the, uh, the people who develop Python might understand that, but the interesting thing is that they didn't make a decision and move on. I'm told PHP 6 will have them. I'll believe it when I see it. Now I'm gonna quote someone who is kind of surprising, but our arch nemesis, DHH, is fond of saying that uh, PHP is the devil. And it is. It suckers you into thinking you can develop something incredibly fast, and then you get 90% of the way done, and you can't do the rest. So we are extremely proud to be Python powered. And by the way, we need a better logo. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna talk a bit about the philosophy that led to the development of Django and that continues to guide its development. We need to make web development stupidly fast. We measure our deadlines in hours, not in days, definitely not in months. We'll come up with a feature over lunch and we'll launch it before we go home. We need to automate the repetitive th tasks. I can't count the number of times I've written form handling code. Django does it for, does it for you. Dealing with the ridiculous politics surrounding RSS is boring and obnoxious. Django just does it. I can go on and on about this kind of philosophy of there are stupid, boring things that every web developer has to do that we shouldn't have to do. And that's what we aim to free you from. We're pretty fanatical about best pra practices. Um, a prime example would be when evaluating uh, an existing Python web framework a few years ago, um, Simon discovered that you couldn't tell the difference between data that came in over get versus over post. That's a big no-no when you're dealing with, uh, you know, with good web interfaces because you need to know the difference between variables passed in the get string and content posted. This is sort of basic HTTP, but it needs to be done right. As an end developer, you, you don't necessarily need to know about this, but the framework shouldn't get in your way of doing things the right way. Finally, our last philosophy, this is still something that Adrian's fond of saying, the ink is never dry on these babies. Now, Adrian comes out of the journalism world. He actually majored in journalism before becoming a developer. And the difference between a web app and something printed on the page is that you can continue releasing content for the web app. So the goal of Django is to be able to develop applications incredibly fast, but allow you to continue to tweak them and use them into, you know, into the perpetuity. So this software all existed in Lawrence and continued to be developed. In March 2005, or around March 2005, a couple of things happened that led us to want to release it. The first was PyCon 2005, which was the first time we had shown the software to, excuse me, to anyone outside of the world online, the horribly misnamed, uh, extremely local development company that is the division of the journal world where we work. Um, and we had a pretty overwhelming response. A lot of people said, hey, you got, you got to release this. This is really cool. The other thing that happened around that time is that Ruby on Rails started to really get this enormous buzz. And we, and we looked at it and we said, hey, we, we can do that too. This was actually the first mock-up of the Django website. <laughs> <laughs> Come July 2005, we had our, our IPO. I think the site looks quite a bit better. So I'm gonna talk a bit about some people that are using Django. One of the things that's, that's blown my mind is how quickly it's been picked up. Um, but actually, the first person I'm gonna talk about uh, is, is us. We have a new CMS called Ellington that drives all our sites, um, some of which they're shown here, but we actually just sold Ellington and Django to Scripps Howard newspapers as their standard development platform for all their newspapers. I, I, I'm so excited about this, I can't even 
express it. Um, the fact that a major publisher has decided to go with an open platform for all of their publishing from down, you know, from down the line, and that it's our open platform. It, it's absolutely thrilling. When you say so, you mean license? Yes. Okay. And <laughs> um, the, we sold them the source code, basically. So they're free to do what they, not the source code to Django, obviously, the source code to Ellington. So they're free to kind of do what they want with it. So it's, we have a weird licensing model, which is based around the fact that there are um, three of us as three developers. So we can't possibly support, you know, 25 newspapers. Um, I'm sure most of you have seen chicagocrime.org. Um, Adrian won a $10,000 prize for it. So you can make money just using Django. There's also a developer in um, Canada, St. Joseph Media, which is um, very quickly launching um, or relaunching sites based on Django. These are three of their sites. Um, Greenpeace is using Django for a social software tool they're calling Melt. I don't know much about it. I know it has something to do with connecting people to work on environmental issues. Um, and more precisely, I don't think it's actually Greenpeace. It's a, a third-party contractor. I think it's ThoughtWorks that's doing the development for Greenpeace. Um, this is just a site I ran across the other day, Passion DC. They're a, a um, dating site in the DC area. They, they claim to have over a thousand uh, uh, single, horny DCites. Grono.net, which is the Polish equivalent of Friendster, has 600,000 users and is using Django in some capacity. Um, they don't speak English and I don't speak Polish, so we've had some difficulty determining exactly what they're using it for. <laughs> and there's quite a bit more um, sites using Django. So I'm gonna shift now to what Django looks like. I'm gonna kind of zip through the basics. Um, I have these slides in there, but I'm not gonna spend much time on the code because we have pretty good tutorials that cover the basics. So I'm gonna rush through them and move on to kind of the cooler stuff that I often don't have as much time to cover in a presentation. Um, first, a word on philosophy. Um, a big question is, is, is Django MVC? This is this, you know, MVC is a big buzzword. We, if we have a methodology, it's that we're anti-methodology. We're not precisely MVC. I, I like to think of our, you know, Django as being MTV. <laughs> Model, template, view. I guess if MVC gets to move the, the order around, we get to move the order around too if we want to. Um, and there's some subtle differences in the way that works. Um, I've never really understood what it is about it, exactly where a view becomes a template or where a controller leaves off from a model. I, I find model, view, template just makes a lot more intuitive sense to me. So models. A model is a blueprint for your data. It describes everything that there is about your data. Um, one of the big goals was not to write SQL. Now, not that SQL isn't a great language, and it's perfect, or mostly so, for what it's meant to do, but you can't describe everything about your data. There's, there's a, num a large amount of data, metadata, that doesn't fit into the database, but that your application code still needs to know about. Um, so a basic model looks something similar to this. And by the way, um, I'm using the new style or magic removal syntax, which is being merged into trunk as we speak. We're having something of a uh, upheaval uh, right now, and I can talk about that more later. Uh, um, <laughs> as soon as possible. Oh, when is that going to be finished? As soon as possible. We're probably going to um, release a um, stable version um, pre-merging to trunk to let people try to try to find if it is actually stable in the next week. Um, and that API will be 99% stable through 1.0 and, and future versions. So a photo is a model. It has an image field. It has a character field. It has a date time field. Now, so far, this, there's nothing here you can't describe in SQL. Um, 
And, and, that's, and that's okay because we love Python. And I'd rather write Python than write SQL. This will generate the SQL for you at this point. Um, and just from doing this, you get a really cool Pythonic API. Photo.objects.all, like that, that's an iterator that iterates over all of the photos. Photo.objects, filter, uploaded equals today. That's the date time dot date dot today. Um, it's amazing how short your code samples have to be to fit on these slides. Um, <laughs> you can do arbitrary filters. Title starts with pants. Uploaded is less than some particular date. You can express nearly everything you need to express in SQL directly in Python. Um, one of the really cool bits about um, this new syntax is this concept of a query set, which is what filter is actually working on. It lets you pass around kind of these canned queries that get evaluated only when you iterate over them. And you can slice them, and you can combine them, and intersect them, and that kind of cool stuff. Um, However, you, there, is, there are ways to drop directly into SQL if you need to, and every so often you, you need to. I used some abstraction layer at some point that actually had no way of just dropping into SQL and running a raw query, and I just, couldn't, just absolutely couldn't believe it. Every so often the language breaks down. And I'm told that uh, Python 3000 won't have support for creating mini languages, so I don't think we can hope to have that in the, in the language. Okay, so back to this other metadata I talked about earlier. So one of the, in my opinion, the coolest feature of Django is the automatic admin interface. Um, our particular development model looks something like programmer develops the data models, figures out, okay, what's a photo, what's a gallery, how does all this stuff work, and then we hand it off to a content producer, a photographer, an editor, somebody. Maybe sometimes ourselves, usually some other content producer. And I think it, that matches the way a lot, a whole lot of websites work. That person needs to be able to enter data into the database, and that's where it's sort of the pain point for web developers starts. Writing these admin interface is, interfaces are so boring. You have to validate this field, you have to make sure that that's not blank, check that this is a valid image type, make sure the dimensions aren't the right, you know, it's just so boring. So this is what it takes to do that in Django. You add a piece of metadata. I've added uh, some, some fields about list display here, which controls what fields show up in the object list. There's a bunch of other options you can give, and that's it. And you, you all of a sudden have a, a production-ready, pretty nice looking, if I may say so myself, admin interface for editing your data. This is the um, main admin interface for all of our sites. Um, and there's, as you can see, there's a huge amount of content in it. We don't have to write a single line of code to make this happen, neither do you, this just happens for you. You get a list page for, edit, for selecting objects. Um, this is a more, our more complex photo model that has fields for which site it's published on. You can filter by creation date, you can search by caption, and also actually, although you can't tell that you can, you can search by, stat, by the person who took the photo. So if you know the name of the photographer, you can type in their name and find that photo. You automatically get your standard add and change pages and you get your data validation. I've just submitted this form without filling in any information here, so it's telling me what's required. I can't tell you how much time this saves us. It's insane. We can, we can simultaneously have our editors uploading information to the site as we're writing the public views. It takes us five minutes to knock out a model, and then they can get to work. The Kansas, uh, Kansas state government released a list of the salaries of any state employees making over $100,000 um, about a week ago. And we found out that this list was released at about 10.30 p.m. on a Sunday night, and press time is 11, and one of the reporters knocked off a story to go in the paper, but it wasn't very long, and he said, we really should do something online. At about 11.30, one of our developers started working on some models for the, the data, had those models done. About 10 minutes later, our, program, our uh, reporter started entering the data. It took him about an hour to put all the data in. By the time he was done entering it, we had a site that lets you browse the salaries of any 
Kansas State employee making over $100,000, search by who they work for, filter by how much they make, sort in different directions. Um, and we launched that feature at midnight um, and got close to 100,000 views the first day. That's what I mean by stupidly quick. We have to be able to do this. this is, these are the deadlines that journalists work on, and we don't get an exception from that just because we work with you know, bits instead of ink. So the next step of design is to design your URLs. And now some of you are going, well, wait a minute, that's not part of this MTV thing you talked about. You know, you need to, well, what's, what's this about designing URLs? That's boring. It might be. Designing URLs might be something that's a little annoying, but God, I hate that. Why should I, as the user, have to know that they're using ASP? Why do I care what the page ID, I mean, why do I need to know this stuff? That's, that's awful. And this, man, that is just really ugly. <laughs> he died recently, did you know that? It's pretty sad. This is Sam, the world's ugliest dog, by the way. <laughs> this, is, this is real, this is not, no Photoshop here. <laughs> Search for Google for it. <laughs> That's a little more like it. This is what URL should look like. And actually, I have a bug on my slides. Really, that shouldn't be a 14. That should be a, a nice little slug describing what the, uh, what the photo looked like. But my, uh, my next slide didn't, wouldn't fit if I used that, so I used IDs instead. So what you do in Django is you design your URLs. They are a part of your application. And I think now with all the, all the REST stuff finally really catching on, people are seeing the value of having URLs be clean and describe a resource and be guessable. Um, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of back and forth um, in, in the Django community about this, this level. I'm, I'm a fanatic that your URLs should be clean and beautiful and as, are they as important a part of your app as, as, as a UI is. One of the things I've noticed at some sites I go to is that I make a guess as to what something is and it either says it doesn't exist or it says you are not authorized to view it. So the, it, was, it was making an observation that uh, some of the sites that he you know, views, he'll make a guess about what a, what a resource ought to be at, and it'll either just not exist, or it, it, uh, it, it will be you know, unauthorized. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's part of it. And forcing a developer to explicitly think about what the URLs are, I think, really cuts down on that. Um, there's a feature in Django that will email the site administrators every time there's a 404 generated on the site. Um, you should see my inbox. <laughs> um, it's extremely valuable, though, because we, we'll, see, we'll see people guessing, we'll see people chopping a portion off a URL and guessing at something, and there won't be something there, so we'll put something there, you know? <laughs> it happens a lot. We, uh, I have a whole sophisticated series of filters that filters out the ones that have a referrer from the ones that don't, because the ones that don't have a referrer are the more interesting ones. Those are people trying to guess URLs. Um, and we get a, a, steady, a steady stream of them. Every time we launch a new app, um, we'll usually have a bunch of people chopping something off a URL in some place or adding something on and trying to do it. Um, and I, I view those as uh, unwitting feature suggestions. <laughs> So this is what designing a URL looks like. Um, a URL pattern is um, uh, a loose data structure. It's very similar to a list, um, although there's a constructor for it because it's got a couple of, of fiddly bits. Um, and each URL pattern is a regular expression and a callback. This, this bit at the beginning, gallery, um, is a prefix for the callback since a lot of times your, your callbacks are all in the same module, so you provide a prefix and they're all underneath that. So this basically says, Anything that matches photos, is it, it calls the photo index function. Anything that matches photos and then some digit. Oh, I'm missing a slash at the end there. Um, matches, goes to the photo detail uh, page. View, excuse me. Um, there's some other stuff you can do with these that I'll get into later. Oh, well, the, the big thing to point out is that um, although they do have the regular expression, you know, beginning anchor, they're actually semi-relative. Um, URL patterns can be included within other URL patterns. So you can say, I want to include all the URLs for photos at, at this point, right? This might be a top level URL pattern, but if I was doing this as part of a bigger site, I would probably match just slash and slash ID. And then that would be included at whatever the 
particular site wanted it to be at. A, a, a good example is um, our, uh, our standard for news stories is news slash something. Um, there's a date hierarchy. Um, but fairly often when we're doing work for uh, clients, they'll say, oh, I want that to be at you know, slash stories. So that's really trivial to make. JJ? Uh, yeah. Um, I've noticed that in the tutorial, the URLs will actually be duplicated in, in say, the templates. And so like it's, you know, it's here in the URL patterns. But when you're actually creating a link, it's also in the templates. And I heard that that was being discussed on the developer mailing list. Yeah. Is that going anywhere? Yeah, the question is, um, so you've got this really nice abstraction mapping a URL to your view. But when you're sitting in the template, when you're developing a page and you need to generate a link to something, how do you do that? The, the current way is, is not incredibly good. Um, we've, had, we've been defining a get absolute URL function on objects that return the URL to that object. And that's extremely brittle. That's at the wrong layer in the abstraction. There's, there's all sorts of problems with it. Um, Adrian just came up with a proposal to simplify this, basically being able to say link to this object and figure out from the object type what view is, it maps to. Um, I don't know what the state, uh, that's going in in some form, but I don't know what the state is. I don't know if you want questions now. No, no, please. please. Can I make a, a very strong well, whatever, take for what it's worth, a suggestion? Yeah. So Routes has a pattern called Rail, uh, Rails has a pattern called Routes, yeah. and Ben Bangor, I don't know if he's here, but he comes to these, he's written a clone for Python, which yeah, Python, 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 which is awesome. And I love. Mm -hmm. and it's great for matching and generation. It saved days of work. Right? Yeah. Um, one of the, currently there's an abstraction about what's used for, oh, excuse me. So the question is, um, Ruby has this thing called routes, which is extremely cool. And there's a Python implementation called routes also, um, which has more or less solved this problem of going, you know, one way to the other. Um, so th there's, there's two things. First, when I say more or less, I've run into, and I haven't used routes in, six months or so, so this, this may not be true anymore. And you know, shut my mouth if it is, but if it isn't. But um, I've run into things that can't be described. Um, we can do pretty, we do some pretty complex stuff with the way URLs work sometimes. And that fiddly bit of going both ways can, can be difficult to get right. Um, answer two is actually the way that URLs are, are resolved is abstracted right now. There's just not a documented way of saying use my resolver instead. So one of the plans is to support routes as an optional um, URL, URL resolver and to probably support object mapper type URLs, even though I hate them. JJ. So um, if you're going to support generating arbitrary URLs in the templates, and um, of course, you, you, looking at this, of course, you're going to want to be able to pass multiple parameters be nice to have a keyword syntax for calling functions within the template. Is that going to happen? Because I noticed that was one of the things that I found most lacking. Sorry. So the, the question is about um, basically about function dispatch within, within a template. Yes? With keyword arguments. Keyword 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 um, I'm going to talk more about the template language later. And I think that's probably the, I'll, I'll remember that and come back to it. Because there's, anyway, I'll come back to that question and remind me if I forget. So at this point, we've, we've mapped a URL. So what does that URL map to? It maps to a view. And a view describes the data that's presented to the user. Not how the data looks, but the data that actually gets presented to them. And this is important because if you've ever, if you've ever seen HTML embedded with database lookups, embedded with you know, web services calls, you, you know how, how hard to maintain that can be. I've actually seen a system, I shit you not, that has every single URL on the site, calls a stored procedure in an Oracle database that generates HTML in the stored procedure and returns it to the web for, for display. I'm not joking. That is just so awful, I can't even start to, be, start to begin. So there's a big distinction between what data you see and how you see that data. And that's, I think, where, in my mind, in my limited understanding, the MVC thing kind of falls apart for me. So this is what a simple uh, photo index view might look like. Um, and actually, if you're going to write this code, you shouldn't because there's a better way of doing it. But I'll get to that later. You've got you to walk before you can run. Um, there's this really simple uh, render to response 
function that takes a template name, uh, and the syntax for this is, has actually changed <laughs> since I wrote these slides. Um, we used to guess the uh, template name extension. Now you explicitly put it in. Um, and a template is rendered given a context. And a context is just a dictionary of values that get looked up. There, there's more abstractions involving a context with uh, nesting and, and things like that. But it's not particularly important. What this does is abstract a couple of different steps that depending on how your, your view looks, you might do, you might do uh, uh, separately. And that's loading a template, creating a context, rendering a template given a context, and returning a response object with the data from that rendered template. Um, you can break each of those steps out and do them individually. Uh, and a lot of times, you, you know, you, you'll need to if you want to do something, you want to set some crazy headers, or if you want to uh, do, you know, caching based on the URL or things along those lines. And that will get rendered through that template. I'm going to go over templates later. So this is another thing of what a photo detail template might look like. Might look like. Um, very, very simple. Um, and the vast majority of views aren't really much more complex than that. I, I did an audit of all my code a while ago, and I think the longest view function was about a, a hundred lines, and most of them were in the 20 to 30 line range, if if not less. Um, the context, or is it just generated a memory and held there? It, uh, not really. There's a cache framework. Oh, yeah, so the question was, thank you. The question was, uh, is there persistence for the context, or is it just, or it just generated into memory? Um, there's a cache framework that lets you, um, at a very simple level, just cache an entire view. Um, it's also extremely simple to cache um, arbitrary objects in the cache. Um, there are some fiddly bits with storing objects directly into the cache. Um, so we don't cache uh, context directly. For, for example, if you cached, if, you, if this context was automatically cached for, you know, let's say, you know, 10 minutes, um, and the photo object had a relation to some other object that while it was cached got deleted, it would cause an error when you pulled that object out of the cache. Uh, not when you pulled it out, but if you tried to access the contents of that object, it would be internally inconsistent. Um, you can store objects in the cache, and they pickle and unpi unpickle fine, but we kind of want you to know that you're doing something. We don't want to do it automatically, because it'll come back to bite you, people who don't understand the, the ramifications of that. Can you uh, just describe fiddly bits? If they, well, what, what I, the question is, can I describe fiddly bits? Um, I use that term to, to describe things that uh, make me uncomfortable about, about coding. Well, the, the example I gave about, the, about relations maybe not being correct once you pull the content out of the cache, um, the, the biggest problem is with many-to-many uh, -many relations, because those aren't using an attribute stored on the object itself. It's, you know, it's using an intermediary join table, but Django abstracts that from you so you don't have to think about the fact that you're doing, you know, joining this table through that table to that one. Um, and that can, in, in corner cases, fall apart when you cache objects directly. Does that answer the question pretty well? Okay. So let's go on to a template. Um, a template describes how your data looks. Um, and for me, actually, this is, this is the part of, of Django that I know the least about, mostly because I don't develop templates. Um, I don't know how true this is of, of most companies, but my gut reaction is that there's, at a lot of companies, there's a separation between the people who write the backend code and the people who do the design. If, if most developers are anything like me, there really should be that separation. I, my stuff I design looks awful. Um, we have extremely talented developers who do most of the template development, so a lot of the tips and tricks about how to use templates are um, not things I deal with on a daily basis. I know how the implementation of the templates work, but I don't know a lot about, a lot about the tips and tricks of using them. Right. Is there a repository of those tips and tricks somewhere, though? Is, is, is there a repository of those? I don't know, but there should be. Um, I don't think that there, there's pretty comprehensive documentation that was written by, by Wilson, basically, by our, our designer and the guy who knows, who uses the template languages full time. So I imagine that that's pretty complete. There's also this really nifty um, automatically generated um, end user level documentation that's built into the admin that, that gives you 
um, information on every template tag built into the system on every filter, stuff like that. Um, it seems to me very noticeable that you guys like don't have to write the templates yourselves because I love Django, so don't get me wrong, but when it comes to don't repeat yourself, I could do apply that perfectly fine to all of Django except for when I go to the templates and then I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. And like I fought that like crazy. So the, the question is basically um, that uh, it, it shows that we don't use the templates extremely well, or all that uh, us as the developers, because often the DRY principle, don't repeat yourself, breaks down when it comes to the templates. Um, I disagree, and let me move on and explain why. This, this look is the first line in most of your templates, extends base. Um, now, I hated this when I started working with it. I absolutely hated this model of extension. Basically, the way it works is you define, at some level, a base template, and you define a series of blocks in that base template, and then your child templates override those blocks and put value in it, it or put values into it. It was inspired loosely by Cheetah, and it's um, very similar to what you might do in subclassing. You'd define a whole class with a whole bunch of behavior, and you'd subclass it and override just a piece of that behavior. Um, and I absolutely hated it. I, I, I said, where's include? You know, I need my include. Um, actually, this generates much, much shorter code. Um, the answer to JJ's question earlier is, if you're repeating yourself, it means that your content's not in the right template. And we can talk about this more later, because I'm seeing him shaking his head. But I still maintain that, that I, am, I am a convert. I've drank the Kool-Aid. I think extension is the coolest thing. I use extension. Um, I'm yeah, extension. Exactly. Okay. So once you've extended a template, this is what a block looks like. As I said, the base templates define blocks, and in here I'm, I'm describing the block content. There are variables. There are um, you can. It's got this object mapper thing that's ripped off directly from Cheetah this time, where um, you know photo dot get image URL that could be a variable, that could be a, a dictionary key, that could be a function that takes no parameters, and it kind of hides that from you. So here's the philosophy behind the templates, right? And here's basically the answer to every time, this is the answer I give every time a developer says, why doesn't the template do X? They're not for you. <laughs> They're not designed for you. No one in this room is the target, I don't think, is the target audience for the template language. I'm not, Adrian's not, most of you aren't. I know from talking to designers who use it that this, that this is what they want. They want something amazingly simple. They, want, they don't want to think about dictionaries. They don't want to understand the difference between an attribute and a function call. They don't want to know what an iterator is versus a list. They want something as simple as possible. So we've, restricted, we've um, resisted strongly making the language any more complex than it is. And we actually, I think, it's too complex already. The, the basic idea is that I need to be able to hand off the template development to someone who really isn't a programmer. Um, Wilson said it really well. He said that, you know, I'm not a developer, and if you try to make me into developer, I'm going to let you down. But if you give me something that I can wrap my head around and something that I can do, I won't bother you. And as a developer, that it makes my ears perk up. I, I love it when my designers don't bother me. <laughs> so that's the, the idea behind the template language. Is, I guess the way to word a question or response to that is, um, does this mean Django does not scale down the case of a single developer developing that? The, the, the question is, does this mean that Django doesn't scale down to a single developer? Um, and that's, that's an interesting question. Um, because, so there's this tension between optimizing for the large case and optimizing for the small case. Um, and I, I don't know how I feel about when the individual developer comes directly in conflict with the separation of, 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 uh, separation of tasks. My, my gut reaction is that there are probably more places where those tasks are separated than where they're not. But then the other part of me goes, long tail, long tail. So it's a difficult question, and it's a difficult tension, and I don't think we have the answer to that. So normally, um, 
Well, I've gone pretty fast here. Normally, this I'm getting to the end of my presentation here when I talk about Django, and I, and I show this next slide of, this is all the cool stuff that's in Django that I don't have time to talk about. This is all the cool stuff that you also get in Django that I'm going to talk about, because it's the best part once you've learned the, the beginnings. Generic views, syndication, authorization, uh, authentication, comments, internationalization, localization. There's actually a few others that I haven't included on here, the cache framework being one of them that is, it saves my ass every day. Um, but it's so simple, I didn't think it was worth even talking about. So generic views. Now, as a, uh, as a developer, you probably notice you're doing the same thing over and over again when it comes to views. You do views that have um, a list of, of these things. You have a, a single thing. You have lists of things broken down by date. You have a create a thing. You have a delete a thing. You have an update a thing. Django does pretty much all of that for you with these, with these things called generic views because those tasks are so repetitive. In, in most cases, in fact, in all the view examples I showed earlier, you don't actually have to write any view code. What you do is, um, in your URL pattern, you farm out to what's called a generic view. And there's this third argument to a, a URL pattern bit, which is a, a, a dictionary of additional data to pass to that view. It's passed in as keyword arguments to the view. Um, so in this case, I'm redoing what I did before without, without any view functions. I'm calling the object list generic view. And I'm passing in a query set, which is photo.objects.all. The, the cool thing about this is that um, this lookup actually isn't done here and not done until I iterate over it. So if, my, if I pass in, I, I can pass in another keyword argument, which is uh, paginate by, which will say paginate my object list by 100 items or by 500 items. And the slicing will be done in the view for me and, only, and the correct limit clauses um, will be issued in that case. Um, so all I have to do at this point is create a template that's called um, photo detail, photos slash detail, so something along those lines. Um, and I can just, just do it all on the template. We use these everywhere. I bet half the views on our sites actually are generic views because you know, you've got an object, you need to show a list of them. You need to show an, uh, you know, a, a, a detail view. And here's what the detail view would look like. Um, the object detail generic view knows to look for an object ID parameter from the URL pattern. Here's a bit that I didn't talk about before. Um, if you define every capture you define in a URL pattern is passed in as a positional argument to the function in the order that they appear, um, named captures with this P object ID syntax are passed in as, um, as a keyword arguments to the view functions. So this lets you do stuff like moving, you can move around where your object ID appears in the list and pass it in. And the object detail views can do, you can do a, a detail based on ID, you can do a detail based on a slug field, um, and you can, you can, there's a number of other options. There's, they're, they're pretty extensively documented, so I will refer people to that. Do you have a question? Generic views extend base, like in that example you showed. So the question is, do the generic views extend base? Um, they don't define a template. So you, you create your own template. Again, because the process of, while, while the process of loading a list of images is exactly the same as the process of loading a list of stories, loading a list of blog entries, loading a list of salary uh, values. That, the view, but not the template. Exactly. Where's the template? You, you define the template. It looks nearly identical to the template I showed before. Know the name. It, it, uh, you can either pass in an explicit name or it guesses it based on the name of the object. In this case, it would be um, photos slash photo detail for this per .html for this particular one. Or you can pass in a, a template name explicitly. Um, and that's pretty cool because you can set up another argument you can pass in to the, or, ra or rather, you can take, let's say I wanted to have a list of all photos and also a list of uh, all photos taken by a particular photographer. You know, we have an award-winning photographer on our staff, so I want to do a Bill Sneed photos page. I can pass in a different query set, photos.objects.filter, author, name equals Bill Sneed, but I can pass the same template if I want to. I probably wouldn't in that case, actually, because we would want to have a different view or different look of that data, but you, you, you can mix and match in that way. Developer and designer, so the developer is always responsible for the template? 
So thinking of the developer versus designer, the, uh, the developer is always responsible for the template. Um, it's a question. Um, no, I mean, the designer is usually responsible for it. Generally, the way that um, we work is um, one of the developers will, will create the data, will create the views, or just define the generic views, and then say, and I'll say, hey, Wilson, uh, photo slash um, photo detail, and I'll go, okay, and go off and do it. And there's a reference in the admin of what's available in that view. So you know what's in the context for, for that view. And, or if you're Wilson, you probably know, just because you've worked with me for a long time, what I've, put, what I've named things. It's kind of funny when um, I, I had a, oh, Adrian launched a, a site in the Washington Post the other day. And we were poking around guessing URLs of things that he hadn't publicly announced yet. And in each case, we were right about them. And we were like, what does this show about us that we, we, we can guess you know, what we, all of us are going to name things? I think. I think Django is very much optimized towards the small team that knows itself well, that knows each other very well. Um, and that's a, a, a space that I'm really comfortable being in. My, my experience as a developer is that those are the teams that get the cool shit done, and those are the teams that I want to target. Um, I, I know that Scripps right now is using Django slash Ellington with a team of 20, I don't know, with a team of a lot of developers, I don't know the number. Um, and I haven't heard that they're having any problems with it, so that makes me very happy. But definitely, this comes out of what we use, and what we are is a small team that works well together. <clears throat> so there's a bunch of other generic views. There's this simple, there's a set of simple views. There's one that just renders, renders a given template that's useful for, um, I don't know, if, if you just want to display some static content at a particular page, uh, you can just pass it off to a, you know, a designer just to do you know, an about page, maybe. Um, there's a whole set of date-based generic views. These are actually the ones we use the most. Um, and they let you do, um, they look similar to the object list views and the object detail views, but they let you do breakdowns year. So you have a year index. You have a latest n objects by date view. You have a year view year, month view, year, month, day view, and then a detail view. Um, and we use this all over the place. It's, you know, it's, it's a pretty common, um, I think, inspired by blogging uh, URL structure. Um, and then there are create update views, which do creating and updating of objects, <laughs> as you might guess. Syndication, this is relatively new um, and is seriously like one of the coolest things in the world. We, uh, we have RSS feeds for nearly every piece of content on our sites. And a lot of times, people are impressed when we tell them that. Um, and they shouldn't be, because they're so easy to create. <laughs> um, so some imports for a feed. Photo feed inherits from feed. I give it a title. I give it a link. This is uh, you know, used for the link element within the, within the feed. It'll, it'll uh, guess the full you know, HTTP, whatever URL for you, or you can give it to it. Um, you give it a description. You give it, um, let's say item. It should be items. Excuse me. Uh, and you return a set of items. That's it. That's a feed. This creates a feed of photos, RSS feed. If I wanted to make it an atom feed, it's one line. I say feed type to atom feed instead of the default RSS feed. If I wanted to find a author for, for each individual object. I define an author name function that takes an item as returned by items and returns the author name given that item. Um, you can get a lot more complex. Most of the time, you don't need to. Again, I'll refer you to the documentation if you want to know how to get more complex here. Um, so I had a whole, oh, there's a question back there. A URL. Ah. Uh, the question is how, how, does, uh, how does this, get attached to a URL. Basically, there's a, uh, a central dispatch function for feeds. So you root them maybe at slash RSS, and you pass in a list of, um, sorry, a dictionary of feed slug, so like photos, to the feed class that you're going to use. Um, and it's, again, that's the philosophy of uh, one site might want to call it RSS slash photos. Another site might want to call it uh, feeds slash images. So you, can, you, you, you do that all in your URL conf. I don't have a slide of that, but the documentation does. Um, so I, I wrote these a while ago, and I had a, a bunch of slides about auth, auth. However, 
um, this is changing. Um, a member of the community, Joseph, is working on um, a new abstracted authorization system. Currently, authorization is all based on models in Django. There's a user object, a group object, permission objects. Um, he's working on a abstracted system that will let you use that the standard way. We'll let you use LDAP, we'll let you use flat files, we'll let you use whatever you happen to, to want to use. The API is not stable, so I didn't want to cover it because I'm relatively sure that where it is right now is going to change. So stay tuned, it's super cool. Um, the way the admin works in this respect is that you define users and groups in each, and there are a set of permissions for each object. So my photo object will have a can, can create photo, can update photo, can delete photo set of permissions, and each user can be assigned permissions based on their role uh, within the admin. How are they assigned the role? The question is, are, how are those roles assigned? Um, they're, it's, they're assigned through the admin. There is an admin interface for editing the user object, just like there's for everything else, and you assign the permissions there. Um, and that won't change as far as the admin works, but as far as, um, and how, how authorization works in the admin is mostly tra transparent, so I, I don't think it's particularly interesting. How authorization and authentication works in your code is gonna be, um, is gonna be different and, and exciting. Um, one of the things that the, uh, the Joseph's authorization work is gonna allow is uh, token-based authorization for doing web services, which is something I'm personally really excited about as I start to do a lot of, more of that stuff. Um, and that's gonna basically just be built in. You'll be able to say, expose a web service for this object at this URL using tokens and just do it. Um, another really cool framework that we use all over the place is comments. Um, we made the decision a long time ago that our sites are uh, a central location for members of the community to discuss things. And despite the fact that we have um, the same problems with commenting, I think that, <laughs> that everyone has trolls and jerks and creepy people and all the various varieties of ugly human behavior you can possibly imagine. What's, what's the line? Uh, uh, an anonymity plus free commenting equals assholes? I, I, I don't know what the, <laughs> I don't remember what the quote is exactly, but man, it applies to our stuff. But that being said, we attach comments to everything. Any place, we, in, in the same way that if it can have an RSS feed, it does have an RS feed, RSS feed. If it can have comments, it does have comments. So Django has a built-in framework for attaching comments to an arbitrary object. And in fact, you don't have to write any code to make it happen. It all happens in the template. There's a series of template commands that will generate the forms and the list of templates automatically without having to set anything up. And this is very simply what it looks like. You load the comment library. Um, Django's template system has a, a way to define custom tags in Python, and these are a set of custom tags. Get free comment list for myapp.photos, photo.id as comments. Uh, myapp.photos is a content type identifier in Django. Um, every, every content type, say a photo, has an app, an app label, which is the application that defines it, and a uh, model name, which is photos in this case. Usually it's, uh, there's some legacy stuff going on here, but it's generally a, a lowercase pluralized version of the class. Um, and you can define what, what each of those are. Um, and it's a way of uniquely referring to a particular type of content. I find this extremely valuable actually, to be able to talk about types of data in the same, using the same uh, language that you talk about data itself. It's extremely powerful. The next argument, photo.id, that's assuming that there's a photo object in my, in my context here, is the unique key to use for the comment. Um, as comments is the name of the variable in the context you want, to, you want to do it, you want to load those comments into. So then for comment and comments, display the, the comment objects. Off for any object that you want. You can yeah. yeah. The question is, you can turn commenting on for any object that you want. Yeah. You just put this in the temp. There's no. There's no uh, uh, s switch to flip or setting to make. Once this is in the template, it allow com it allows comments, and you can do things. Um, you you have the full power of the template language, so you can wrap this in an if block if you want to. You know, conditionally allow comments. An example is. Um, when we first, we had an internal debate about a year ago about whether or not to allow comments on all news stories. Um, and there's been some interesting industry um, you know, buzz about whether or not this is a good idea. Um, there's been some talk about sources being reluctant to contribute to stories because people will trash them in the comments, and we've seen that happen. There's been buzz about reporters um, 
not liking what people have to say about their stories, and we've seen that happen. Um, but what we've also seen happen is it's just an explosive growth in our user community since we turned comments on stories. Um, but what we noticed really early on is that certain types of stories don't deserve to have comments. The, the one that really drove it home for me was there was, we, um, living in the Midwest is interesting. Um, we cover um, Little League the same way that uh, the New York Times covers you know, sports. I mean, it's crazy. We have, we have player cards for 10-year-old batters. We send, out, we send out videographers to tape nearly every Little League game, and we run them on the local cable channel. We have photo galleries. We have a, a, a weekly print magazine devoted to youth sports, comes out once a week. We have a staff of three people who work on this magazine, right? Crazy. We published a story about, um, just a routine story about, you know, the uh, 10 and under Northwest Lawrence girls lost to the Southeast Lawrence girls. And we, and we got just these comments on that story that were just disgusting. Just these people being, I, I think we banned 10 users that day. It was awful. And we kind of realized there are certain stories that people should not be allowed to comment on. So the, the conclusion to this long rambling story is that stories now have a allows comments field. And our producers will make a decision on whether or not those stories allow comments. Um, How about this issue of putting children's names in papers for being able to track who they are and target them and so forth? The question is what about putting children's names in papers? Um, when we do the player cards, it's always with the parents' consent, and uh, we generally, um, our general policy is not to publish um, children's names. Um, the player cards are really the exception, and, and that's because pretty much the parents want us to do it. <laughs> um, yeah? How do you manage the schema when you need to add a field for an object? What do you go through to go from one version to the next? So the question is, how do you manage schema evolution? How do you add fields to objects? Uh, the answer is, stay tuned. Um, we have some proposals about how to do it, and we actually have a student who is applying for um, Summer of Code to work on that, and I'm relatively sure that he's going to be accepted because I'm going to be making that decision. <laughs> With regard to the edge, uh, you said common fields are embedded everywhere in every object. So how do you manage GoFoot compliance you know, if you have like 13-year-old kids posting a comment on a story? How, yeah. So how do we manage com compliance about who gets to post comments? It says that you can put up identifying details. Right. right. Well, basically, there's a user agreement that people agree to when they sign up. Um, th this particular example uses the free comment object, which is very similar to the regular comment object, except that it doesn't have user fields. We actually require registration for all of our comments. Um, uh, since I'm running out of time, I'm going to zip through a, a couple of things real quick. Um, this is what it looks like when you load a form. This spits out a, a little template that... Uh, that has all the fields for posting the comment. And there's built-in security to make sure that people can't spam you by posting you know, to a particular thing and some other clever details there that you can look at. I'm briefly mention internationalization and localization. Django is right now translated into 23 languages, and uh, including Welsh, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> which thrills me to no extreme. And uh, um, more, hopefully, on the way. Um, the vast majority of the framework is, is internationalized, and if you see places where they aren't, it's a bug, and file it. Um, and there's really nifty end user tools for doing uh, internationalization. Did you get the internationalization to support pluralization correctly? The question is, did we get internationalization to support pluralization correctly? I, I don't really know. I'd have to refer you to, um, to Hugo, who's in charge of that. I, I um, am a naive American with no foreign language ability. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit, just a teensy bit, about what's in the future for Django. Um, we have um, this merge happening right now, and we have a 1.0 release coming up as soon as we possibly can. And if you like Django, and if it's something that you want to use at work or at home or to hack on, please, please, please help us get 1.0 out the door as soon as possible. 1.0 represents, is going to represent for us API freeze. Code will be backwards compatible, as with Python, 
um, you know, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, et cetera. We're going to be very strict about that. This is the time now that we're kind of in a code churn, getting things exactly how we want it to be. So if you have input, please, now is the time to do it. In the further off future, um, we continue to use Django every day internally, and we have a number of grand visions for what the future might bring, including a redesigned admin interface. Um, there's um, this Dojo integration, which is happening right now, and that's going to bring with it eventually some really slick Ajax support. But you got to do the foundations first, and we want to get those right before we have uh, things sliding in and, and uh, the, the yellow fade technique. Not only faster than most Java and Ruby on Rails sites, but faster than most static sites. I found that to be my experience as well. It's been a couple of times when we've moved a bunch of flat files into Django, into database Django apps, and it's ran faster. This one absolutely blew my mind. This is one, as a Mac geek, this is one impressive open source project that shows, or at least seems to show, that the people who designed it really know what they're doing. It feels like opening up an iPod box and admiring the packaging, design, and button layout. And that's from David Asher, uh, the author of the Python cookbook and other things as well. I hate to rave, but this level of detail and usefulness is unprecedented in my professional experience, especially in a free and open programming framework. At this point, I'd say Django is the winner in the LAMP as in Python space. So questions at, the, at this time, contributions, djangoproject.com. Okay. Right. So the question is what about support for uh, composite primary keys in the, in the database model? Um, the, the, it doesn't have it right now. Um, I'd love to see it get in, uh, but it's not high on um, any of our lists of, of priorities. I'd love to see someone tackle the problem. I don't think it's particularly hard. There's only a couple of small issues that need to be worked out about how, um, how exactly it would work. Oracle support would be in 1.0? Will Oracle support be in 1.0? So here's the thing. Um, it's the, 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 the real stumbling block for both Oracle and SQL Server support is actually um, uh, limit clauses. Because doing those um, in a way that integrates well with the way other database packages do it um, is actually really obnoxiously difficult. And we've been hesitant to kind of hack up the, the, the core parts of Django to deal with the, the really weird, especially SQL Server. Oracle's not quite as bad as SQL Server is in that space. But um, I think the answer is, yeah, we're going to you know, hold our nose and do it, because that's, that's, a big, that's a huge group of developers we'd love to, to have working with Django. Any other questions? Deploy with Mod Python, and do you know of any other successful deployment strategy? So the question is, do most people deploy with Mod Python, and do I know of any other successful deployment environments? Yeah, um, that's actually one of the the, the bits of, of Django that makes me really proud is that deployment, high you know high end, large scale deployment is super easy. Mod Python's the sort of standard way. That's the way we always do it. I know people who de also deploy um, using fast CGI and either. Um, Apache mod fast CGI or light HTTPD. I've heard good things. M um, my experience has been dealing with fast CGI is kind of like it's another set of server processes I have to manage. If I'm doing lighty and fast CGI, I have to have scripts to start and stop lighty, and I have to have scripts to, to spawn my fast CGI instances. I'd rather just deal with um, with mod Python. But I'm told anecdotally that the speed's much better with Lighty and Fast CGI, and you're nodding your head. So chances are there will be, I will experiment further with it. Um, right now, um, we're using actually a pretty complex setup where we have um, Perlbal, um, which is a load balancing software in front of our Apache processes. Um, and that's more than adequately solved any performance problems we've been having. But um, you know, as I I'm sure as uh, Scripps rolls out Django for 15 plus newspaper properties, we're going to uh, get some interesting data about how to scale Django even larger than we use it. What's your critique of Ruby on Rails? <laughs> so, what's my critique of Ruby on Rails? 
I, um, it's written in Ruby. <laughs> really, um, if, if I hadn't come to Lawrence and discovered Django, or if, if I hadn't been elsewhere and, and you know, seen it open source, I probably would be using Ruby on Rails today. It's, it's a great framework. It solves many of the same problems that we have. Um, I don't really have anything, well, I have bad things to say about it, but I won't. I will refrain. A Chicago Python user group back in November had Adrian and David Heinemeier Hansen speak. So they're side by side, each presenting their own framework. So it's a good comparison of the two. I'll so repeat that for the, for the record. Yeah, there was a, um, the Chicago Python users group sponsored a meetup um, six or so months ago uh, in Chicago uh, where they invited Adrian, um, the other uh, uh, creator, creator of Django, and, and uh, David Hansen to come speak. Um, and they both presented their frameworks, and then they had a hour-long uh, kind of Q&A session with both of them. Um, and it was videoed, and it's online at uh, snakesandrubies.com. Um, if you want to know more about how the two compare and uh, uh, see them, see Adrian and Dave, David argue about which is better, you should go check that out. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's snakesandrubies.com. If you just search for snakes and rubies, you'll find it. Are there any plans to add more WSGI spots in the code so you can say put in mining to the your template? Yeah. So the question is, are there are there plans for more um, more full featured uh, WSGI? support um, so you so you can do things like uh, plug in other uh, uh, whiskey components um, I guess the answer is is yes and no um, it, Django as it runs now if you run it as a fast CGI thing it uses whiskey if you run it as mod Python it's got a custom handler we'd like to get rid of that particular uh, duplication of code and so that the, the, the dispatch goes whatever web server you're using, WizKey, Django. Um, in terms of supporting other plugin points for doing things like uh, other template languages or other object dispatch type things, um, we'd like to support that within Django itself. You already can if you want to use a different template language. Just in your view, use a different template language. I know a lot of people who are using Django with, um, with Cheetah. Um, I think some people are using it with, uh, 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 with Kid. Um, so you already can do that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, URL dispatch is another one of those points that you ought to be able to choose a different package if you want to. Basically, our approach with most of the, those things are we obviously think the defaults we've chosen are the right ones, but we don't want to prevent you from, from overruling us. Um, there's there's a, a line between um, uh, opinionated software and obnoxious software, and we'd rather be the, the former instead of the latter. Can you talk about the process of plugging in Django on a legacy database? Yeah, yeah. OK. So the question is, can I talk about uh, using Django with a legacy database? Um, without changing, without changing the legacy database. <laughs> <laughs> right, obviously. Um, so there's a, so there's this, there's a command line tool, Django Admin, um, which is kind of your central point for um, doing things <laughs> with your models. Uh, Django admin sync DB is what reads your models and apply and puts the SQL into the database. Uh, Django admin, you can do Django admin SQL, which will dump to the, to the console the SQL for a particular model. There's a command, Django admin inspect DB, which will read an existing database and dump a model file for you to use. Um, my experience has been that that model file needs to be uh, tweaked by hand sometimes. Um, the big pain point is, as you asked earlier, with composite keys. If, you, if your legacy database uses composite keys, you're, you're SOL at the moment, um, and that sucks, and we should fix that. Um, but for the most part, I've, I've been pretty successful um, using InspectDB. Um, the, the, the thing that some database backends don't report, um, don't report foreign keys correctly, so they come out to to Django as just integer fields, and you have to go in and change them to foreign keys to, to make Django work perfectly. But um, it should be good to get you up and running. I know a lot of people who are um, just kind of point Django at a database to get the free admin interface. I love that. Um, and if it doesn't work for you, please file bugs, because that's one of our, that's kind of one of our hot features that we want to make a lot better. What's the 
SQL database and version are you using? The question is which SQL database and version am I using? Um, we use Postgres um, at work. Oh, love it, absolutely love it. You can, I'm not, couldn't pay me to switch. Um, we're using uh, 813. Right now, um, my experience with Postgres is that the .o releases haven't been as good as the o .1 releases, so I generally wait until 801, 802 to, to upgrade. Um, but uh, there's some stuff coming into 81 that will probably make me upgrade, or maybe it's 82. There, there's some stuff planned for future releases that are that are I'm I'm drooling over right now. Are you using a certain adapter, Python adapter for it, or? The question is about using a certain Python adapter. Uh, right now, Django only supports PsychoDB version one. Um, we're going to support version two once they actually release it, and and not a, there there is hasn't been an, an API freeze. We have no problem supporting you know a, a beta version, but they haven't guaranteed that things won't change, and we just don't want to support that. Um, there's been talk of um, a a uh, what's the other one for Postgres? Yeah, there's been talk of support for that one, and it's one of those um, it's adding another. Database um, uh, support for different database adapters should be trivially easy. We we don't use it, so we wouldn't really be able to test it. Generally, database support at this point, um, I use Django. We use Django. People within the you know our core development community use it with Postgres, with MySQL, and with SQLite. So we're happy maintaining those. But if you want support for your, if someone wants support for their database, you have to commit to maintaining that. I mean, that's the biggest reason why Oracle support hasn't been checked in. There are working patches, but no one willing to commit to maintaining it. And we don't use Oracle, and we're not going to, we don't want to use Oracle. <laughs> so we're not going to commit to maintaining it. Your deployment, then it's Postgres on its own server, and Apache on its own server, and then load balancer. <laughs> the question is about our, our deployment. I'll just, I'll just sketch it out briefly. Um, so uh, about a year ago, I saw a talk by uh, Brad Fitzpatrick of LiveJournal where he talked about their server setup. And, and if you've seen that talk or seen his slides, this is going to sound incre incredibly familiar. We've got um, load balancers up front. Um, right now, those are just, just ProBal processes on the same web server boxes um, because we're ordering new hardware and it's being shipped to us. And those will eventually be two boxes. There'll be round robin DNS going to the two of them. Those run ProBal and those run memcached. Um, and I've written a plugin for Perlbal that will um, that will read cached pages directly out of memcached and serve them without hitting Django. Um, the, the basic problem you run into as you start to scale up, uh, I've heard referred to as the light heavy or the the uh, the spoon feeding problem. Excuse me, light heavy is the solution to it. The problem is that um, you you actually. Uh, Django is much much faster than you can possibly push out to clients. Um, before we were using load balancing, our, our web servers were like 99% idle. They were just sitting around waiting for clients to read data. So we had to have hundreds of hundreds of Apache processes, and those would eat up memory and start swapping. Um, the Perlbal, the, the big bonus of Perlbal is that it will read the data from the back end as fast as that giggy link between them can, can process, and then spoon feed it to the client as the client needs it. And ProBal processes are extremely cheap compared to Mod Python and Django and the database adapters and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I find that's great. We have um, a database server on its own box. And actually, the biggest piece of advice I can give to someone trying to scale out Django is the first thing you ought to do is move your static media to a separate box and a separate web server. You would not believe what a big difference that makes, serving your, your static media from a, a box running Lighty all off on its own. Um, it, it was you know, it's night and day. That's a huge, huge boost, even before you move your database to a separate box. Do I need to wrap it up? Or All right. So thanks, everyone. And I'm going to stick around here if anyone wants to ask me questions. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak here. I'm really thrilled to do it.